Hello, I'm Gary Williams, I'm the Editor of Physics Education and I'm the Manager for the Institute of Physics Teacher Network. We're here in Liverpool at the 2012 ASE conference and what we're about to show you is a little cloud chamber. Now, I say little, it's not as little as the usual ones we might use in the classroom, um, but Richard, Kerry and Francis are going to show us how to put them together. Please tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Frances Green, I'm a retired physics teacher and I currently work half a day a week for the Institute of Physics as a Physics Network Coordinator in Cumbria. I'm Richard Bonello, I'm an engineer turned physics teacher. I also work as a teacher network coordinator in the Birmingham and Shrewsbury areas and I've done a little bit of work with the University of Birmingham's particle physics group who have made some cloud chambers which they lend out to schools. You seem to have some interesting looking fish tanks there with you, what are they for? These are for making cloud chambers, which are devices that enable pupils to see the paths that radioactive particles have taken. Why do you think these cloud chambers deserve a place in the classroom? Well, historically these are very important because these were the research tool 100 years ago. These were the first tools for looking at, at particles, and so they are the kind of the granddaddy of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, historically, for example, the first photographs of an antimatter particle were taken using one of these, uh, and today they remain um, a very useful classroom tool because everyone can see what's happening. And when you're using one of these in the classroom, it really gives a buzz to the atmosphere. A group of pupils or a group of teachers will be peering down, looking into this and seeing the um, paths that the particles have taken and getting really excited about it. That sounds fantastic, but what exactly are we looking for? Well, they don't see the actual charged particle, they see the trail that it leaves behind. Um, inside the clown chambers we have a supersaturated vapour and when a charged particle passes through it, it ionises the air and the ions attract the um, vapour which condenses on them and you have a little trail of beads like an aeroplane contrail left behind. So that's what they see. And where can a school buy these cloud chambers? Uh, they don't buy them, they make them and that's what we're going to show you today. Uh, so we've got our fish tank and its lid and the first thing we're going to do to the fish tank is to put in a piece of felt that will enable us to um, put the, the uh, liquid on that makes the vapour. So we take off the sticky backed backing and put carefully the tape along the fish tank sides and my assistant has got a new one. So you don't have to be too careful about this. You do have to get it. Like that one. Right, so I've got the felt in the tank. And then I want to get the lid uh, sorted. The first thing I need to do is to remove the hole of the middle. I'm going to do that with a small saw, carefully. So I'm going to saw along the edge here and to save time, I've got one I did earlier. So here we have the middle completely removed. One thing we need to do to it is to remove, is to block up the edges there where the vents are. So we do that with duct tape and carefully use it to cover the gaps. And when you've done that, put it on a baking tray that it just fits into and carefully stick it down to the baking tray with some more duct tape. Pushing it down really very firmly And I'm doing this quickly so you can take a bit more time, a bit more care. Right, so there we have the base completely finished. 
And the last thing we need to do to the base before we put everything together is to get our thoriated welding rod and to make, which is going to be our source, to make some little bits of blue tack to stand it on to keep it just off the base. So that bit's ready. And lastly, we need our liquid that we're going to squirt around the felt, being fairly generous. Okay, so the next thing we need is our tray for the dry ice. And so if you take an ordinary equipment tray and get some kind of insulation, uh, this is foam, but you could use uh, expanded polystyrene or screwed up cardboard, anything that will give you a fairly flat surface and keep the dry ice just off the bottom of the tray. Then we need some dry ice. Take it out to flatten it in the bottom of the tray. Put the lid or the top on the bottom. Make sure it's clipped down. Put that onto the tray and then we need our light source. And we're using one of these uh, banks of LEDs. And in fact, you're going to need to put that just about there. And now you need some patience. You have to wait about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour for the whole thing to cool down, for you to get the saturated vapour layer, and then all of a sudden you'll start seeing the trails. Richard, how common are these in schools? How many schools would have one? Well, not many schools do. I mean, schools tend to have the small ones, which, as Francis said, are not very uh, useful, perhaps too, too small. But what they can, can do, of course, is come along to one of our workshops, which we as network coordinators run, and we do these things periodically. They'll see them advertised on the IOP website or to their local coordinators. They can come along to workshops and build these themselves. We'll provide the materials, and they can take it away back to their schools. If they prefer to borrow one, they can contact me if they're in the West Midlands, and I can arrange a loan from the University of Birmingham. But we'd like to encourage people to make their own.